Hey guys, welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Ashley Mova, and this is The Daily Show, where we give you all of the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Leading off the show today is Mark Ellis. Welcome one and all to the best movie news show in the entire galaxy, regardless of where we broadcasted from. Today, we're here at the Collider Studios. Tomorrow and Friday, we will be live in San Diego at Comic-Con, and we're driving down later on today, and Ashley, we're going to be whistling a tune the whole time. We at sure least are. those of us at the panel that can whistle. Some of us better than others. Also here, Dennis N. Hey everyone, uh, I'm really looking forward to going to Comic-Con, getting all that coverage for you guys, and also our meet and greet, so we'll see some of you guys there. Also want to give a birthday shout out to my friend, Avi Tall, who has a big birthday today. She did our, our Game of Thrones reviews with me and Perry and everyone else. Unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to celebrate with her today because I'm going down to Comic-Con. <laughs> also here, Perry Nemiroff. I am only here today to whistle, okay. so well, let's go see for some, it. Let's, it's really impressive. Dennis and I cannot whistle. Yes. Ashley keeps talking a lot of game, but we haven't actually heard whistling yet. I don't want to impress you guys too much. Perry said she can whistle, and she's been very good at she it all really Oh, my God, the pressure's on. Now the only song I have in my head, though, is the one from the... The, the, the Xander the, Cage. Yeah. The let's let's hear it. Do it. Do it. Okay, ready? Mm-hmm. I'm jealous. Damn. I'm jealous. Damn. That might as well be right. Otis Redding sitting on there the dock go. in the bed. <laughs> We're going to just cut the Collider news music, and from now on, I'm just be. going to whistle in every video. So get ready for that. That was really impressive. You can see more of that, as Dennis mentioned, at the live meet and greet. Yes, Harry <laughs> will be whistling for all four hours. Live. That's going to go down tomorrow <laughs> night, Thursday evening, from 5 to 9 p.m. at the Fox Sports Bar and Grill that's at the Hilton Bayfront Hotel. So if you're at the convention center, it's not across the street. You just kind of walk across the way there a little bit and you will find all of us having a good time come by say hi take a picture with ashley and without further ado <laughs> before we get to the sidebar we actually do have some sad news to report and that would be the passing of the legend gary marshall ashley has some more on that yes yeah, sad news to report writer producer director and actor gary marshall has passed away at the age of 81 according to cnn marshall passed away from complications of pneumonia following a stroke at a hospital his publicist michelle Vega said in a statement tuesday Marshall created some 1970s and 80s TV staples, most notably The Odd Couple, Mork and Mindy, Laverne and Shirley, and of course, Happy Days. His film credits include directing Pretty Woman and The Princess Diaries. Collider Video offers their deepest condolences to Mr. Marshall's family and friends. Yeah, and you know, when you think about it, I saw it on Twitter last night as we get a lot of our news now, and I, I just had to sit back in my chair and just reflect on not only what he did as a film director, but also as somebody who is producing some of the most legendary TV shows we've ever seen. As Ashley said, Happy Days was the first thing that came to my mind. And then I forgot that he was also one of the geniuses behind Mork and Mindy. And there's a great story about casting Robin Williams in there because the casting of Mork was down to Robin Williams versus Richard Lewis. And who's a great comic, but a very different style. And I think Richard Lewis actually told this story that when Robin Williams was in there auditioning, he was in the waiting room and he could literally hear the walls shaking because Robin Williams was making Gary and everybody else in there laugh so hard with what he was doing. And he knew he had no shot to book the role of Mork. Uh, in, the, in the film uh, genre, I would say that A League of Their Own is actually the one that stands out the most to me because it was just such a beautiful marriage of so many things from social topics to just great comedy with Gina Davis and Tom Hanks in the lead roles there. He will be missed, and he is one of the all-time great comedy directors that you'll ever see. Perry? He he had such a small, small role in A League of Their Own, but right. it, always, it always meant so much to me because my grandfather was in the candy business, so for some reason I always just connected the dots between the two of them, so I'll never forget that. And also just speaking of uh, little cameos he had, his cameo in Hocus Pocus, I love that scene where they go and they trick-or-treat at his house and he's the devil. I, I thought that was the greatest. And I grew up uh, watching a lot of Nick at Night. So all mm -hmm. of his shows, I mean, Happy Days, of course, a lot of Laverne and Shirley. I had a guinea pig named Chachi for a while. <laughs> <laughs> I still miss Chachi. But um, I, I mean, this is just sad, sad news. And it doesn't, it's, it's always sad news, you know? It just doesn't seem to be stopping lately. And it's a great point that, that Perry brings up, uh, Dennis, is that Gary Marshall, uh, for everything he was able to do behind the camera, when he was in front of it, whether it's in interviews or actually doing a small role, he had just a warm, friendly presence about him. And I think that's something that, that not a lot of people are able to bring to the screen, regardless of who they are. Yeah, for me, it's funny, because I most remember him, besides directing uh, Pretty Woman, is his role in the movie Soap Dish where he played a network executive. Yes, mm -hmm. uh, yes. Yeah, he, he was great on camera as well as behind the lens. 
definitely Pretty Woman and um, Princess Diaries. So he launched the mm -hmm. careers of Julia Roberts and Anne Hathaway, which is, you know, and besides that, then he created all those shows. It's like all these thing, iconic things that he, he's he been behind. Ashley, when you look at the lineage of Gary Marshall movies, is there one that stands out of to you as your favorite? Of course, The Princess Diaries and Happy Days. <laughs> I grew up with Happy Days. Monday, Monday, Happy Days. Oh, that's, that's really, really sad, but it's nice that he had a long life. You know, it's, it's sad, of course, of him passing away, but um, he created some great work. Absolutely. R.I.P. Gary Marshall. And this is a fun fact that our good buddy Ken Knapsack has seen the Pretty Woman movie five times in one day. Tweet him. Wow. Ask him about that. Pretty Woman five times. He watched it in one day. And with that, we will actually get to the official stories today. Ashley, what's up first? Principal photography is now complete on the new Alien film from director Ridley Scott's Prometheus follow-up Alien Covenant. The production has officially wrapped filming, marking the occasion with the release of a new set photo featuring Scott and Covenant's new protagonist played by inherent vice breakout Catherine Watterson. The movie, described as the second chapter in a prequel trilogy that connects directly to Scott's iconic 1979 film Alien, Covenant picks up some time after the events of Prometheus as the crew of the colony ship Covenant it, discovers that they think is an what they think is an uncharted paradise whose only inhabitant is Michael Fassbender's David, the sole survivor of the Prometheus expedition. The image tweeted from the official Alien Twitter account shows Watterson with a look that is very reminiscent of Sigourney Weaver's hero Ripley. The actress is joined in by the cast by uh, joined in the cast by Billy Crudup, Damian Bashir, Carmen Jogo, Jesse Smollett, Amy Smites, and Danny McBride in a movie slated for release on August 4, 2017. Mark, what do you think about the new image released for Alien Covenant? Hmm, that's my thoughts, Ashley. Hmm, indeed, because it's very interesting that we hear about Alien Covenant wrapping production. We get this new image right before that little thing. What's it called? Comic-Con. Huh, that's very interesting, particularly when you consider the fact that on Saturday in Hall H, they're going to be doing a special Aliens 30th anniversary panel with a lot of your favorites from the Alien movies. I wonder if they'll have anything else to show us, Dennis. We're going to have to wait to see with that one. But in the meantime, I feel about this news as I usually feel when I hear something is rat principal photography. Save the SD cards, know where they are, protect all that <laughs> stuff with your life. And it's kind of cool that we're almost a year away from seeing this movie in theaters. Yeah, I'm happy that they finished production, which means that they're going to start going to post-production and we'll get the movie, you know, fairly soon. In terms of the picture, though, it makes me nervous. It makes me nervous because we see Catherine uh, Watterson in there in that Ripley role, all the rumors and hints about her possibly being Ripley's mother, which I am totally against. I don't want that to happen. Remember when they first showed that one picture before and everyone speculated, well, what kind of role is she playing? Maybe she's a small role. To this picture to me tells me if this is what they're they're putting out there, she's the main character. And if she, look, if she plays a Ripley-like character, I'm fine with that. But if they actually tie it to her, I, 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 I'm I, just totally against that. Perry, do you share that level of hesitancy? Yeah, I think one of the last times I was on Movie Talk, we were talking about the same topic because that story had just broke claiming that she was going to be Ripley's mother, which I believe it was a rumor that might have been taken down since. So I don't know, maybe the studio is trying <laughs> to hide it or I, whatnot. But... I mean, look at this image. She looks kind of just like her. I also find it funny. Look how much fun Katherine Waterston's having and then Ridley Scott is just so serious. He's making a real good movie there. But I, I'm just, I'm really excited to hear that it wrapped because I'm really looking forward to this movie. I love the cast. I mean, it's also out there, even if she is uh, playing Ripley's mother, they've also said numerous times that this is an ensemble movie. So I'm really excited to see, especially uh, Danny McBride in that uh, in that captain role. And, and I'm a big fan of Amy Simons as well, so I really want to see her in this. So I'm I'm pumped. I just hope she's not Ripley's mom. Uh, do you guys think we're going to see anything from this that we haven't seen already at Comic Con? Oh yeah, I think so. I mean, why 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 do that Aliens you know panel 30th anniversary panel and not show something? from Alien Cup. As someone who just got home from Star Wars Celebration where they showed nothing at the future filmmaker panel. So you're, you're pretty jaded. <laughs> Perry's pretty jaded. She's like, they're not going to show anything. Well, because I walked into that panel being like, look at who's here. We're going to see something. They're going to do something. And then 
It was a QA. It was a good QA, <laughs> but we didn't see anything. It, so I'm not Saturday. getting my hopes up. It, it, there's going to be a lot of news coming out of Hall H. And by the way, you guys can stick to Collider Video for all of the breaking stories that are coming out of Comic Con. We're going to have all that stuff covered from head to toe for you. Maybe we have something about Alien Covenant. We'll have to wait and see on Saturday. Okay, what's our next story? It will be a bittersweet farewell to see actor Anton Yelchin one last time as Chekhov when Star Trek Beyond hits theaters this Friday. And since producer J.J. Abrams is already looking ahead to Star Trek IV, it raises the question about what will be done with his character in the future. Now, according to Abrams, they won't be recasting the role. Speaking to Post Media Network, Abrams said, I would say there's no replacing him. There's no recasting. I can't possibly imagine that, and I think Anton deserves better. I have thought about it, we're working on it, and it's too early to talk about it. Though Abrams isn't clear on whether or not they will kill off Chekhov in the end, most fans are hoping for a proper send-off for the beloved character. Dennis, how do you think they'll handle Anton Yelchin's character in Star Trek IV? Well, hopefully they don't kill him off. I mean, I'm, I'm hoping in, the, in Star Trek IV they have a scene or, and they ask about his character and they mention his absence and then talk about how maybe he has moved on to other things, maybe moved to a different ship. He's working there, doing things that he wants to do. I think it could... I, I don't need something like uh, Furious 7 where they digitally put his face there, but they did have a proper ending where they said this character is taking this different path and going a different way, and they had that nice song at the end. I, hopefully something more like that versus actual putting a CGI thing there. That's right. I mean, th there's two ways to look at this, or I guess two two different ways that you can process handling it is that one, you're not going to kill the character off, and then also you're not going to recast him for sure. So if he's not going to be recast, that you're not going to put somebody else in that role, that's definitely the right play to me. It's just a matter how they do want to do that send-off, whether they, they kill the character off or, like Dennis said, if he gets assigned to another ship where maybe you don't necessarily have the character physically there and try to recreate it digitally. Maybe you just hear a voice. Maybe mm -hmm. there's something that they can do and we all know J.J. Abrams knows how to work some magic with vocal tracks putting them in where you wouldn't think they could fit so maybe we just get to hear his voice one more time in Star Trek 4 but I'm glad that they're that they're taking the necessary uh, route with handling the character thus far, Perry. How do you feel about it? Yeah, I'm not surprised this is the news we're reporting right now because, of course, J.J. Abrams would be really respectful in terms of treating his character the right way. So I am so, so glad to hear that they're not recasting. And I highly, highly doubt they'd ever kill him off because there's in the movie because there's no reason. There's no reason at all. It, it could happen in one line of dialogue where it's like, oh, he's off on another mission somewhere else. That's it. His character lives on through the franchise, and I think that would be the most respectful way to handle it. That's right. Yeah, I don't think you need to you need to make it a huge thing. It doesn't have to be the first third of the movie where they're talking about him. But I think it would be nice to have a proper send off because he was instrumental in these first three Star Trek films. I have not seen Beyond yet. Maybe I wind up at the screening tonight at Comic Con. I'm really looking forward <laughs> to it. But it is going to be a little emotional seeing him on screen in the Enterprise for the last time. All right, what's our next story, Ash? Universal Pictures is slowly building up an impressive roster of interconnected monster films that they hope will invigorate the studio's most iconic franchises. Star Trek and Transformers co-writer Alex Kurtzman and Fast and Furious screenwriter Chris Morgan assembled a writer's room to craft new takes on beloved characters, and the first film in this universe will be the Kurtzman-directed The Mummy reboot, starring Tom Cruise. The other films in development include a new Frankenstein, starring Javier Bardem, The Invisible Man, starring Johnny Depp, and a reboot of the Van Helsing property. The writers of Van Helsing recently spoke a bit about the film, teasing a source of inspiration that may give us a clue as to the direction the film is heading. Lights Out writer Eric Heiserer and Prometheus writer John Spades are bringing Van Helsing to life, and when HitFix recently spoke with Heiserer about Lights Out, he cited Mad Max as a major source of inspiration for the new and improved Van Helsing. I can only say that early on, our inspiration for his behavior and his mannerisms was all in Mad Max. The writer then went on to talk about the diversity of the Universal Monsters movie, elaborating on how these characters will exist within the same universe. It's early days right now. I can't say that the decision that a lot of us made was to go and just write the best movie we could in our own corner and make sure it's good on its own and didn't necessarily need to link arm in arm with anybody else and to be totally different from the other films. One may be a little bit more comedic, action adventure -y. One can be very much a traditional horror piece, that kind of thing. And then we'll see what happens as the projects evolve and we get a chance to convene and talk and make sure the movie feels like they are all in the same world. Perry, what do you think about Heiser's comments about the Van Helsing reboot? 
This is interesting. I mean, it's Mad Max. I'm a big Mad Max fan, so I guess, yeah. But I I can't say I see the correlation between Mad Max and what I understand Val he- Van Helsing to be. I, they're both eccentric, I guess, but in very different ways. So I found the comparison really interesting. But I kind of trust the writer at this point because he wrote Lights Out, and I'm a big fan of that. So I'm excited to see what he does from here. The more interesting quote to me is the fact that he says each movie will have a different tone which I find very interesting I like the idea of them going into their own corner and writing their movie their way because I think we'll end up with better individual movies that way but at the same time part of the reason franchises like Star Wars all the Marvel movies are that good is because the interconnectivity is so on point so having a little bit of a tough time at this point wrapping my head around the idea of seeing all these different movies that are supposed to connect but feel so different but then again when you look at each monster they all do call for a different type of movie so I'm just curious to see how this all pans out right now. I understand the little bit of apprehension you have, but I love talking about this. I love that we're not talking about another comic book shared universe, but it's also not like Oscar movies. It's something totally different, and it's going to be a shared monster universe. So now we have Van Helsing in the mix. I love it. Is it going to be good? I have no idea. Do I think that he could sync up with a Mad Max-style character? Yes, in the sense that both Van Helsing and Mad Max have gone through some stuff that no human should necessarily have to see, and it might have jaded their outlook on life itself a little bit and it also makes a lot of sense for if you're making a movie to reference Mad Max because we all love Mad Max you just say Mad Max and you get a bunch of fanboys like yeah Mad Max yeah (laughs) they they got the right tone for this they're going Mad Max it doesn't matter you can say that about the Muppets oh we're going with a Mad Max Kermit (laughs) yeah Mad Max he's great man that's perfect maybe I would have seen the Muppets then (laughs) I I think we would totally like everything if it had a little bit more Mad Max Fury Road in it so if you're going to inject some of that into Van Helsing I think it's great these comments get me even more excited for this monster shared universe because one day dennis we are going to get a new monster squad movie bank on it you heard it here second yeah it just kind of sounds like over in television everyone keeps dropping the wire or game of thrones when they refer to (laughs) to their new tv show it's going to be like this it's going to be like that so that's what i think they're doing here and also i think the character is just going to be maybe one of less words he's just not going to speak a lot and he's just more maybe he's more grunting and you know I, i i do think It's cool that they're gonna totally make each movie different, but if they're eventually, I'm assuming they're gonna have an Avengers style, you know, film that brings all of them together. Hopefully they don't diverge too much that they can all come together and it makes sense and it feels right. Yeah, I, I think that something like this, you make a great point where you're trying to sell a property, you know, three years before we've seen the movie, but it seems like at least they're off to the right start. It's just a start at this point. It's not a sprint. It's a marathon, but they got a mile under their belt and we're kind of excited about it so far. All I'm picturing right now is the Muppets doing a little dance and then a Morton <laughs> Joe popping up behind and just being like... I love the idea. And they're going against <laughs> Nanny from Muppet Babies because she was a little weird when never saw her face. I don't trust you, Nanny. And with that, we move on to buy or sell. This is the part of the show where Ashley's going to present us with a topic. We will simply say whether we buy it or sell it. And who answers what is going to determine who rides with who on the way down to San Diego. <laughs> Uh-oh. Okay. The first full trailer for Triple X, The Return of Xander Cage, has been released, giving us a full view of what to expect from Paramount's third volume in the franchise. When the extreme athlete turned government operative, Xander Cage, played by Vin Diesel, comes out of his self-imposed exile, he finds himself embroiled in a mission to find the deadly weapon known as Pandora's Box and uncover conspiratorial corruption in the highest levels of world governments. The film is directed by DJ Caruso and co-stars Ruby Rose, Nina Dobrev, Tony Collette, T- Donnie Yen, Tony Jaw, Rory McCann of Game of Thrones fame, Samuel L. Jackson also returns. Triple X, The Return of Xander Cage will hit theaters nationwide on January 20th, 2017. Mark Byers saw the first trailer for The Return of Xander Cage. I, I buy it. It's, it's got a Mad Max meets Game of Thrones meets The Wire yeah, yeah, kind of yeah, feel, yeah. which is meets what I Muppets. want in a trailer. Meets <laughs> the Muppets and our favorite Muppet of all, the very bald or he shaves his head, Vin Diesel. Uh, I am going to shock myself because I totally sold that little trailer to the trailer we talked about earlier this week. But that week. was 
concept, though. You're selling the concept of that? I, I, was just, I, I wasn't selling the concept of a trailer to the trailer necessarily. I just thought it just looked douchey. Okay. This one does not. This one actually looks like a fun, ridiculous, over-the-top action movie. Do you really need to be skiing down in a jungle? <laughs> do you really need to take a motorcycle into a wave to ride it? No, you don't need to do any of this crud. Do you need to skateboard in between two cars that are going 80 miles an hour? Of course you don't. But that's the fun of a ridiculous action movie. I bought it the minute I saw the end of the trailer. It said January 2017. This is the kind of crap I want to see in January. I'm going to be excited to sit down, get a big tub of popcorn, and just laugh my face off at the idiotic but fun action movie that I think Triple X, The Return of Xander Cage, is going to be. Dennis, are you with me? Let's buy it together. I am so on the fence on this one because mm. either it is going to be this over-the-top, tongue-in-cheek, like where they, they ridiculousness that they know what this movie is like, which they discovered Fast and the Furious. At first, Fast and the Furious tried to be serious, and later on they realized how ridiculous it was, and that's when it became fun. So if they start off this movie and, and they know what it is, then I'm buying it. But if, if they try to take any type of serious, dramatic turn to this, then I'm selling it. It, it. It's a harder window to get into than you might expect because you want to have a lot of fun over the top action, but you don't want it to intrude into naked gun territory, you know? We want to be laughing at the craziness we're seeing, not laughing just at the pure stupidity of it. So it's a hard thing to pin down. Do you think they nailed it with this trailer, Perry? I would say so, and that's coming from someone who has never seen a single one of these movies ever. But if you start a movie trailer out with some Samuel L. Jackson, I'm probably <laughs> going to be in. So clearly, I need to rewatch all the other ones. But si but also seriously, that song will get me into just about any action movie. Because I remember they used that same song. It's uh, the Voodoo Child cover mm -hmm. by uh, Brick and Mortar. And they used it in the Hitman Agent 47 trailer. And right. I, I edit a lot of our junket interviews. And I'll tell you, nothing is more fun than editing in a trailer with a really fun song like that. So I could have watched that Hitman trailer over and over. And I'd love to edit some junket interviews for this now so I could play with that music again. It's also a risk whenever you put in a remake of a classic song in a trailer. Because sometimes it really put, uh, you know it pans out well. Other times it doesn't. But this time, I think it worked for what you wanted. And what I like about it is that it is a teaser trailer in the sense that the first half you would have no idea what movie you're watching if you didn't see it there on YouTube saying Triple X. So I'm not a huge fan of the character. I've never seen a Triple X movie, to be honest with you, but that could just as well have been like Steven Seagal's character from Under Siege coming mm -hmm. back, or that could have been a mulleted Van Damme for Hard Target 2. Doesn't matter. It's that there's this mystery guy that we've seen have adventures before, and he's finally back in action. Do I, I particularly care? No, but I buy the trailer. I like that they have uh, Donnie Yen and Tony Jaa is going to sure. be in this. And, and I am going to side that they know what this film is just by that stupid skateboarding sequence, the skiing <laughs> down the mountain. Like, it's just so ridiculous that they've got to know what they're doing. Again, in a jump, he, he, he jumped out of a plane or a helicopter or whatever. He had skis on. And I'm like, oh, he doesn't look like he's got a parka. I hope it's not too cold on that mountain. Don't <laughs> worry. You're in the middle of a jungle. It's yeah. 90 degrees. Bring your SPF. So stupid, ridiculous, but maybe a great act. I can't believe we all just bought the Triple yes. X trailer. That ski scene is the most, like, how do they even shoot something like that? You know that? what's great about the movie? We get to see even more jungle skiing. Yeah. <laughs> All right, next topic. <laughs> According to a report from Variety, the Denzel Washington adaptation of the famous August Wilson play Fences will hit theaters in limited capacity on December 16th before expanding on Christmas Day, putting it up right in the middle of Oscar season and against such works as David Frankel's Collateral Beauty, Peter Berg's Patriot's Day, Passengers, and Rogue One, A Star Wars Story. Washington stars in and directs the movie version with Viola Davis co-starring. Both actors won Tonys for their performances in the 2010 Broadway revival, which was first performed in 1985. Fences is a story of a one-time promising baseball player now working as a Pittsburgh garbage collector and the complicated relationships with his wife, son, and friends. The film's ensemble cast also includes Stephen Henderson, Russell Hornsby, McKelty Williamson, Giovanna Depo, and Sonia Sidney. Dennis Byersell, the Oscar chances for Denzel Washington's offenses. I'll buy it because he's every time he he's in a movie, he's got a chance to to, to get an Oscar. I mean, he got one for for Training Day, which wasn't exactly an Oscar Beatty type of movie, and this seems like this is more geared towards that audience. Plus, he's already played the role before and won a Tony for it, so he's very familiar with it. He's directing himself which is, I think, his third feature film. He did uh, Antoine Fisher and The Great Debaters. 
I don't think he's been nominated for anything he's directed himself in, but maybe this will be the first time. Yeah, I, I think it makes sense. So I would buy that it has Oscar chances for sure. I think it's going to be a stacked field this year at the Academy Awards. I really do. So I'm not sure that you're looking at a lot of wins for Fences, but it, like Dennis said, anytime you have these kind of ingredients with Viola Davis and Denzel Washington, who, like you said, if you already have the Tonys to back it up in 2010 and you're taking this property, Fences is actually a play that we studied a lot when I was in college, and it's a, it's a terrific piece, and it's certainly lends itself to Oscar bait material. It's great counter-programming for all the other stuff that's coming out that week. I like that they're pushing it up to get that release date in order to garner Oscar consideration. It has all the makings of something that could be somewhat of a force come award season. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to buy without seeing a single bit of promotional material for this, but I guess the fact that he did win a Tony for it is more than enough for me to buy it and the fact that he's involved. But this was just such a nice surprise to hear because I feel like we haven't heard anything about his Fences movie in something like three years. Yeah. And then all of a sudden the story popped up and they dropped it right in a, a perfect Oscar spot. So I'm really excited about that. And back when they first announced that he was doing it, he had just given some really nice heartfelt quotes about it. I wrote down like the first sentence of one where he said, it reawakened me about the work and my commitment to the work. And that's only the beginning of the quote, but just that kind of passion that he clearly has for this project project and the attachment he has to it I think that is definitely putting it on the right track to start that's right uh, three buys again I mean I think that we can be looking at fences if nothing else to be something that's a great change of pace for all the other stuff around Christmas and it could be a contender come Oscar season and now we move on to a picture of a Power Ranger right <laughs> yep. mm. a new image of the Power Rangers unmasked has been released by USA Today as part of their Comic-Con preview the new look showcases our heroes and their spiffy new costumes unmasked and ready to go Saban's Power Ranger Rangers follows five ordinary high school kids who must become something extraordinary when they learn that their small town of Angel Grove and the world is on the verge of being obliterated by an alien threat. Oh no. Chosen by destiny, <laughs> our heroes quickly discover that they are the only ones who can save the planet. But to do so, they will have to overcome their real life issues and band together as the Power Rangers before it's too late. Power Rangers also stars Elizabeth Banks as the villainous Rita Repulsa and Brian Cranston as their alien commander. Zordon. The Power Ranger movie opens on <laughs> March 24, 2017. Perry, buy or sell the new image of the Power Rangers. I have to buy it. I love Power Rangers. I grew up loving Power Rangers, and you slap the name Power Rangers on anything, and I'm probably going to buy it no matter what. Um, it's T difficult to look at this image right now and judge it without seeing a clip or a trailer or something to give us a better sense of the tone beyond Brian Cranston's quotes comparing it to The Dark Knight. <laughs> That's but another one people drop as well. I feel like one, <laughs> once... <laughs> <laughs> I feel like once I see this, see the costumes in action, I'm going to like them more. My one problem with these costumes, and it's cut off in this image, why is there so much boob armor? You can't um, you can't see it right here, but I see the boob armor. Yeah. It's they're very you important. You can't see it in this image behind us or the one that flashed on the screen before, but it's it's unnatural and it was in the other image as well and that is the only thing that's rubbing me the wrong way look boobs are essential to the survival of mankind <laughs> so yeah you need to have a lot of boob armor you need to have some protective plates in certain places for the men as well so i would expect to see them lumbering around with a lot of stuff around their waist but we didn't get any of that in this picture so I'm going to have to sell We it. need to go and check the other picture to make sure they didn't have extra armor somewhere else. Because if they, I mean, then it's not fair, right? I, it's it's going to be a very easy fight for an alien to win if you have <laughs> Power Rangers for to worry about their private parts running around with too much armor on there. They're going to look like medieval knights. But again, I haven't seen that image yet. So all I can go on is the fact that I do not come from a place of being a Power Rangers fan. I did not care about them when I was a kid. I was too busy with my Ninja Turtles. So seeing this, it doesn't win me over. I am dying to see something where I'm like, yes, that is awesome. Now I'm on board with this movie. I like that teaser poster they put out when you couldn't really see what the hell was going on. That was on. a great poster. But this, it just, this is like the first time I've really seen them all together in the gear. And I can barely tell that they are Power Rangers, which is fine, because again, I'm not a huge fan, but it also doesn't win me over to caring about this movie yet. So gotta sell it. Dennis? Uh, Perry, you, aren't you uh, interviewing the, some of the cast and crew at Comic Con? I'm really pumped Saturday. about that. You we ask about the boob armor. I, yeah. <laughs> First question. <laughs> <laughs> boob As armor. the wheels start turning in my yeah. head, how I can appropriately squeeze that Just in start there. Start whistling afterwards. They'll yeah, buy it. Then, yeah, yeah, then it'll be fine. 
Yeah, uh, I'm, I buy this image. And look, I did not grow up a Power Rangers fan, so to me, I have no attachment to it whatsoever. I, I all I think of it is like those silly rubber suits from the 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 the, the, the show. But what I've seen from Power Rangers so far, with the costumes that they had, the on-set uh, photos that have leaked, and then even this image, which I think actually looks pretty cool. You know, see, you're showing off the cast, you're showing off the costumes. What I really want to know, though, is what are these real life issues that they have to get over in order to fight the aliens? Oh, a lot of stuff going on like, in Angel Grove, man. Like, what kind of like, is it like social issues? Are people getting bullied or people, you know? No, I bet the one kid found the other one's diary and just read it, uh, you know, at the assembly. It's heartbreaking <laughs> stuff. It really is. Uh, did, did you buy or sell? Yes, I bought it. You bought it. Okay, so we have one sell. I'm the only Mr. Poopy Pants here today. <laughs> Mr. Poopy Pants. Ashley, do you like this image? You know, I was a huge fan of the Power Rangers growing up. I want to be yes. Kimberly the Pink Ranger. I buy it. The boob armor is making me think of, you know, in um, Austin Powers when you had the... the <laughs> that is that's, what it looks imagine like. Imagine like that's what happens in the movie. Maybe there's a hidden weapon in there. Maybe. We just don't know What's right going to be my like deciding factor in this movie, I think, is Brian Cranston as Zordon. Because when I was a kid, I used to picture Zordon. Like, that's how I pictured God. Zordon's <laughs> like... I'm not sure how they're going to handle that. <laughs> that's why I was laughing during the story. So picture God is Zordon but um, I'm just wondering how they're going to handle Brian Cranston's face in a tube all right, you know I mean? and we have a new title for today's movie talk. Zordon is God? Question mark? No, like I would, when I would think of God, like that's how I'd picture his entity. You know? that's like, he's, he's an all-knowing being that happens to be played by Walter White, America's favorite meth dealer. Uh, Wendy, I want to turn it over to you because I know the chat has been going crazy, not only on the Power Rangers pick, but let's turn back the dial to the Triple X trailer. Were they buying it like we were surprising ourselves doing so? Surprisingly, yes, I'm seeing a lot of guilty pleasure buys on this. It looks like the movie's going to be a big popcorn fest, especially with Samuel L. Jackson, Donnie Yen, and Tony Yaw in the mix. Uh, Radio Flyer 1986 says, Big buy for me. They didn't bullshit us with anything in that trailer from the moment it starts. It's completely over the top ridiculous, and I love it. It's going to be a dumb action movie, and I love it. And uh, Z Finn says, This is going to be a two corn type movie. <laughs> uh, and moving on to our Power Rangers image, I'm also seeing a lot of buys for the Power Ranger image. It looks like it's just getting a lot of people intrigued for the movie. Sean Peter Sai says, or Peter Sell says, I love the look of the new Power Rangers, but will absolutely sell if it's all CG. And AJ Henson 02 says, Power Rangers will be the next Pacific Rim. All I care about is seeing the Megazord with today's special effects. All right. That is the vibe of the chat room. And I'm glad you guys agree with us on the silliness and the two corn nature <laughs> of Triple X. The return of Xander Cage. Let's go to what's opening in theaters this weekend for our segment appropriately titled Opening This Week. What do we got, Ash? First up is Star Trek Beyond. A surprise attack in outer space forces the Enterprise to crash land on a mysterious world. The assault came from Kroll Idris Elba, a lizard-like dictator who d derives his energy by sucking the life out of his victims. Kroll needs an ancient and valuable artifact that's aboard the badly damaged starship. Left stranded in a rugged wilderness, Kirk Chris Pine, Spock, Zachary Quinto, and the rest of the crew must now battle a deadly alien race while trying to find a way off their hostile planet. Also coming out is Absolutely Fabulous, the movie. London publicist Adina Monsoon, Jennifer Saunders, and best friend Patsy Stone, Joanna Lumley, flee to the French Riviera after they accidentally knock supermodel Kate Moss into the river Thames. <laughs> <laughs> if you've never heard of Absolutely Fabulous, so you probably have no idea what's going on, but it's a television show that was on years ago, and I think Ashley's going to love it. I think it's right up your alley. Uh, I know my sister's a huge fan of it, too, and I've watched and been entertained by the TV show, so I think it's kind of cool that they just randomly have this movie coming out in the middle of the summer, but maybe it is good for a lot of chuckles. Certainly from that description, it lends itself to a lot of humor. And then you have, of course, what we're talking about with Star Trek Beyond, how much I I'm looking forward to it and how yet again it seems like it's happened more than once this summer I'm the last guy to see the movie after everybody else here at Collider's already enjoyed it so Dennis can you send people to see Star Trek Beyond in theaters this weekend well I'm also one of the few people who hasn't seen oh, good. it right? check yeah. it out together I'm really looking forward to this because I a lot of people especially the hardcore Star Trek fans did not like the J.J. Abrams movie especially Into Darkness I did I understand they are different from the original Star Trek series and Next Generation, but I enjoyed them. But 
what I'm hearing is that this one actually appeases both fans. It appeases the new fans who like the rebooted, kind of more action-oriented, and then also appeases some of the, the traditional Star Trek fans. So I, I'm really looking forward to it. Absolutely fabulous. I hadn't heard of. I've never watched the TV show. <laughs> I watched the trailer and it, it would mildly interest me. I probably won't be running to the theater to see it, but I will probably catch it on Netflix or cable. The thing is, Kate Moss, do people of the younger generation today know who Kate Moss was? Because Kate Moss was huge when I was younger, like she was the big supermodel. But nowadays, I, I, I think this movie does not care if okay. you know who Kate <laughs> Moss is or not. I think it's for the fan base of Absolutely Fabulous, but like, it's a lot of drinking. It's a lot of hijinks. It could be a lot of fun. Perry? I'm actually looking forward to Ab Fab way more than Star Trek. <laughs> what? No, no. No, I'm not. I am like, absolutely what? not. I'm not going to see that. But I don't know. If your fans have fun. <laughs> I'm going to join you guys, though, for your screening of Star Trek because I haven't seen it yet. And it's, oh, man. Okay. It's good. really upsetting me going into comedy. Con where they're going to screen it the first night and everyone's going to be talking about it and I want to see it. But I'm just thrilled to hear that the early buzz is pretty good. So I'm pumped to see it when we get back. Thank you to our friends at AMC Theaters. Make sure you guys go to amctheaters.com for all your showtime and box office information. That's where you can go to get tickets for either Star Trek Beyond or Absolutely Fabulous or any of the other movies that are coming out this weekend. I also got to check out Lights Out before too long. Everyone needs to check out Lights Out. Uh, well, not every. I mean, if you get scared easily which I do, <laughs> and I stay in a lot of hotel rooms by myself, and I turn on the lights, and then I turn them off, and I see stuff. It looks really oh. scary, but I really want to see it. <laughs> All right, let's move on to Mailbag. We want to remind you guys, at the end of the show, we're going to take some time for your live Twitter questions, so start tweeting them right now. Collider Video is the at. Nobody's ever said that before about Twitter. I just did, because I'm a <laughs> grandfather. And now we go to Mailbag, where you can email us anytime, Collider Video at gmail.com what's the first in our mailbag brandon rodriguez writes hello everyone i'm a regular viewer viewer from houston texas and while i can't remember exactly how i discovered collider i have journeyed with you guys for over a year now and you are all celebrities in my book thank you for all you guys do the Dark Knight, while categorized as a superhero flick, is considered by many to be one of the best crime dramas of recent time and falls closer in line with some of the grittiest crime thrillers we've seen. My question is this. If done right, could Rogue One, a Star Wars story, while yes, being a space opera flick, end up being one of the best war films of recent times? The film is set to explore complex characters with plenty of gray areas and to be darker and grittier than previous Star Wars films. What do you guys think? Thank you for taking my question. Keep up the good work and bring on the filthy. It's a hell of a question, Brandon, and I appreciate the angle you're attacking this from where The Dark Knight is a great crime thriller. It certainly is. It may not be mentioned when you hear crime movies on its ear, but it is great in that genre as well. And I think it's Star Wars Rogue One. Look, you have people behind the camera that are also involved in war movies like Saving Private Ryan, Black Hawk Down, Zero Dark Thirty. So you're definitely going to have a war element to it. And they even told us at Star Wars Celebration last year in Anaheim that it's called Star Wars for a reason. They're going to focus on the war. As far as it being one of the great war movies in recent memory, I think you're going to have a tough time jumping that hurdle because one of the things about war movies that appeal to viewers is that they are based in a war that actually happened here on planet Earth. I think that that, that has an emotional tug to us. But if you're talking about a war movie that takes place somewhere else in outer space or something that was totally fictional, I think that Star Wars Rogue One has an excellent chance at really standing out of the batch. How about you, Perry? I would love to see this happen. At this point, I'm not really sure if I can guess that it will, just because, you know, with all the rumors, who knows what direction they're really going in with all of this. But based on especially the stuff that we saw in that three minute featurette, I mean, that to me looks like a war movie. I go right ahead and highlight all the explosions you can. And, you know, I brought this up in one of our recap videos, but if you freeze frame some of that stuff, it's it's really gritty and dark. You could see people like flying in those explosions so it looks like they're going really intensely forward with this being a war movie but the uh, the other thing is the fact that at celebration they revealed this featurette and they revealed a quick trailer and both highlight how intense of a war movie this is going to be so that right there is leading to me leading me to believe that that is the direction they are continuing to go in with this yeah, it, it, i have trouble wrapping my brain around it too because when you see the images particularly the stuff on the beach like the palm tree and then you have the the, the stormtroopers that are in the on the shore they're coming in you see them on the waves i don't want to i come from a military family the apple fell very far from the tree i don't <laughs> want to compare it to the beaches at normandy but it does look like they're storming a beach so i think that people see that and they would start to think oh this 
this is this might have the same feel as that harrowing scene from Saving Private Ryan. Dennis, do you think that Star Wars Rogue One is going to be able to make the leap to be a great war film as well? Well, I, I think even, no matter how great of a war film it is, we will always associate it with Star Wars. It will be a Star Wars film first. It's just much much like Dark Knight. The Dark Knight, as, as good of a crime drama as it is, no one thinks of that as it first. They think of it as a comic book superhero movie. So I think what you were saying before about taking that leap, it, 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 it's tough for people. And then what you're saying about like real war movies that happen on Earth, I'm sure, you know, Perry, Perry, uh, well, like the one about how we fought off the aliens, you know, in the Independence Day. <laughs> Stop it. Like th those real war movies, right? That's what you're talking Battle about. Battle Los Angeles. Yes. The aliens attacked us right here, but damn it. It, was it, like it happened on Park. Earth, right? It was real history, <laughs> and the president gave that speech. <laughs> and Abraham Lincoln was indeed a vampire hunter. All right, what's next in the mailbox? Eco writes, Hi, Collider crew. Love the show. It's always fun to watch you guys. With modern songs being a hit or a miss in trailers as of late, I've been thinking about movie theme songs. They seem to have become a rarity nowadays, save for the James Bond songs. What are your favorites? Some of mine are Rainbow Connection from the Muppet movie, Chris Cornell's You Know My Name from Casino Royale, and Eminem's Lose Yourself from 8 Mile. Thanks and keep up the good work. Uh, that's a great one with Lose Yourself, too. Perry, what uh, stands out to you as far as a great movie theme? Well, if we're talking about scores, at least my favorite movie theme of all time is Jurassic Park. I just had to throw that out there. But <laughs> there are some recent... I, I understand that there's a lot of misses in terms of putting a popular song to a trailer nowadays. I mean, we've seen it a lot in the past couple of weeks in particular. But there's a lot of great ones. One of my favorite, though, of all time is the Crazies trailer. I think it came out in 2010. And they have a great cover of Mad World and that that trailer go look it up if you haven't seen it but that to me is the perfect use of a cover song in a trailer absolutely yeah I mean when if you take the angle of a, a song that was written specifically to be featured in a movie the two that stand out to me are uh, Huey Lewis's The Power of Love for Back to the Future I think that's just such a great theme song and it just gets you so locked into the vibe of what you're going to experience with Back to the Future and then also John Bon Jovi going solo away from Richie and the rest of the band Bon Jovi and doing the Young Guns 2 soundtrack and including the hit Blaze of Glory. God, I love that song. Still gives me chills when I hear it today. Dennis? Well, you have the classics of uh, Over the Rainbow in Wizard mm -hmm. of Oz. Yeah. You have Singing in the Rain and Singing in the Rain, which kind of got co-opted into uh, Clockwork Orange. <laughs> um, for me, a uh, recent one, though, is Bruce Springsteen's The Wrestler. Uh, in Aronofsky's The Wrestler, yeah. it actually does not play throughout the movie. You see it in all the trailers, but throughout the movie, they don't play it once. And then, the, and then as soon as that last frame hits and the credits start to roll, they play the song. And it's just a perfect song to end that movie with. Another and, uh, good trailer example, because you guys just name dropped this, Battle LA. Go watch that trailer. I forget what the song is called, but they use a really great song in that trailer. That oh, really? makes Yeah, it gives it a really dark, intense vibe. I mean, that trailer alone is, is a lot better than and, the movie. Uh, Bruce Springsteen also did uh, Streets of Philadelphia. That was a good theme song. In the video, he's actually singing live in the video. I'm looking and nobody cares. <laughs> All right, now let's move on quickly to live Twitter questions. We're going to take two today, Ashley. Two live Twitter questions, okay. then everybody get in the fusion because I'm driving us all down to SD. Okay. Delcia Aprilla writes, Hello, Collider Crew from Indonesia. 1 a.m. here. What's your favorite <laughs> foreign slash non-English speaking movie? Oh, man. Tough. That's a tough one. Uh, the favorite foreign is, uh, the, uh, is it The Brotherhood of the Wolf? Is, uh, is one that I believe it was a French film and it was just so good, so wrapped me up. And then if you want to go to some of the scarier horror movies that America sometimes takes and remakes, sometimes they do it well, sometimes not as well, but Ring Goo, I loved The Ring, so I went back and I watched Ring Goo, might be even scarier than The Ring that I saw in theaters it was released here. How about you, Dennis? Uh, I have two. One is the Brazilian film City of God. Uh, oh, that's such a good call. I love that movie. It's one of my favorite movies of all time. And then there's a French film, A Prophet, which is like also a crime drama, but it's set in a prison. It kind of has a Godfather-esque feel to it. How about you, Perry? My mind is very much on horror right now, and I think I'm gonna say Wreck. 
Wreck is really good. And I actually really like the, the American remake Quarantine too, but you should go back and watch Wreck if you haven't. And then there's also Troll Hunter. That's one of my favorite, uh, it's, it's like a documentary about people in, I, I, th I believe it's Norwegian, and they go and they look for trolls. And it is a delightful troll hunting movie. Absolutely. And I can also say uh, with confidence, The Raid and The Raid 2 are ones that yeah. should have popped my head as soon as I read the question. But it's 11.43 a.m. here, and I'm already in need of a nap. So if it's 1 a.m. where you are, get some <laughs> sleep right after this last Twitter question. All right. Alan Reed writes, we've seen actors overacting, but do some directors overdirect? <laughs> Yes, they do. Yes. They do all the time. So you have a director and they have their signature style. And man, do they love bringing every last, you know, this beat of sweat into a movie. And I think that's the case with a young man named Michael Bay. It just sometimes it works brilliantly in something like 13 Hours or The Rock. And sometimes it's just like, please stop directing so much crap with Transformers. I know we bitch about it on end here, but I just can't stop thinking that Michael Bay is the primary culprit if you think about somebody who over directs an action movie. How about you, Perry? Hmm. I'm trying to think of an example of an over director. I always, whenever I discuss this, I always have a hard time, especially when I'm writing a review, because, you know, I wasn't there behind the scenes. I don't know if that was a choice the actor made or the director made, but Michael Bay is definitely a good example. Before I name drop anyone else, I should probably do some more <laughs> hardcore research on this question, though. <laughs> we're happy to throw Michael Bay under the bus. Anybody else, we're going to take a beat and think about it. How about you, guys? Uh, yeah, Michael Bay's one, but then... I, I think of George Lucas in the prequels. Mm. You know, he tried to change mm. like every little thing. He wanted to be in control of every little thing. I, you know, they, they, he would change like the looks and expressions on people's faces from shot to shot. And I think it, once you start getting too focused on all these other things instead of the actual important things, which are like the acting and the story and the characters and all that stuff, and you're worried about, you know, if this little tiny, you know, production design element is exactly the way you want. I think that's when you start getting into dangerous territory. I know some people have issues with the J.J. Abrams lens flares, and uh, I'm seeing it in the chat room, so I'm going to say it. Zack Snyder's a name that's Hi. popping up in there a lot from the fans, so maybe somebody to consider if you talk about over-directors. Yes, I said that. Now I go down to Comic-Con, so I look forward to all the hate. And make sure you guys remember that our meet and greet is going to be tomorrow night at Comic-Con in San Diego, the Gaslamp District. The Fox Sports Bar and Grill is where you want to be from 5 p.m., to 9 p.m. Come by, say hi, and give Ashley a high five or a hug if you're wearing your boob armor. Uh, that's you, not, not you, Ashley. Uh, I want to thank everybody behind the crew for pulling off this production moments before we get in the car and head down there, and everybody up here on the panel with me. Dennis Zen, where can everybody find you this weekend? Well, I want to also clarify, five to nine, we're going to actually be outside of the Spot Fox Sports Grill, kind of in the Comic-Con HQ little stage area. Yes. But it's, it's right outside of there. We'll be around that area. Also, I want to remind you guys, we are having movie talk. We're going to have tons of videos. It's just not going to be this movie talk. It's going to be us, like, in a little room, you know, talking about the things that happen. So we will have movie talk. We'll have a lot of videos coming out. It's just not going to be the same as our regular day. And you can find me on Twitter, at ThinkHero, or on Instagram, Dennis.TZNG. Perry Nemiroff, where can everybody find you? P. Nemiroff is my at on the social medias. <laughs> and you will find me on all sorts. Dang. You feel better now, don't you? You good. will find me on all sorts of uh, videos, I guess, all week. I'm, I'm doing a lot of interviews in our in our little sweet area. So keep an eye out for the Power Rangers ones. And I, I will probably slip in some sort of boob armor crush. <laughs> That's my goal, actually, for Comic-Con. It's always good for all you youngsters at home. Have a goal in life. Perry has hers now. We'll see if it pays off. Wendy Lee, where can everybody find you this weekend? You can find me at Comic-Con, also at the meet and greet, and maybe trying to catch Mark Ellis somewhere at the Gas Lamp District. And you can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat at Wendy Lee Zaney. And Ashley Mova, are you going to be there this weekend? I am. You guys can find me wearing my boob armor on Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, Ashley Mova. Happy Wednesday, guys. Happy Wednesday, <laughs> indeed. It is a great hump day, and we're very excited to see all your smiling faces down there in San Diego this weekend. And just note, hot off the press, I will be popping into the American Comedy Company tonight at 8 p.m. in San Diego to do a special live taping of Doug Benson's podcast, Doug Loves Movies. So you guys come on out to that. I think it starts at 8 p.m. and I'll be on stage from 8 to about 9.30, then running off to my first beer. So thank you guys so much for joining us. You can find me at Mark Ellis Live. And before we go, make sure you guys subscribe to Collider Video and bookmark Collider.com on your interwebs because that's where you go for all your breaking news stories. You're going to see a lot of stuff there from Comic-Con this weekend. That's all for us here. We'll see you guys in San Diego. Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. 
Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.